On the 14th of June 1982, the Argentine surrender of the Falklands is signed upstairs in the Secretariat by General Mario Menendez to the liberating British forces marking an end to the 72-day Falklands conflict, which claimed over 800 lives. It was a conflict which placed the quiet, hardy and isolated Falklands onto the world stage. The end result was that the islands operate as a self-governing British overseas territory. This very room where the document was signed is now used by the Falkland Islands government as a place for decisions to be made. A plaque proudly sits in the corner, displaying a lasting reminder of its significance. Every year the date is celebrated as Liberation Day as the community comes together and salutes those who fought in the conflict. This is the basic story we all know, but did the conflict really just stop there? The capital Stanley and other settlements rebuilt and moved on, a legacy spanning over 40 years with huge amounts of mines left over, which rendered land inaccessible and dangerous to the public. And this was really very annoying, it was frustrating, uh, it was very sad to find out that many of our most treasured locations where we would go with our children, we would go for picnics, and of course we were angry as well, angry with the Argentines. I mean, they occupied the islands for 10 weeks. Uh, we thought, well, that's the last we've seen of them, and they've gone and they've taken everything you know, with them that they wanted to take, and then we discovered they put the mines down. Why did they do that, we said. Initially, the British Royal Engineers attempted to clear the minefields, with an officer broadcasting weekly updates to the public on the local radio service. The problem was that at the time nobody knew the scale of the mines and just how many there were. In the radio updates the officer would proclaim that they have found another minefield and would quickly fence off the area to the public. It became apparent however that there was a bigger task at hand. It seemed such an impossible task with the peat and, and we didn't know how well they were, the minefields were mapped when they were laid um, and you know we've all seen how the sand shifts in the Falklands so there was always that well they'll have moved you know it, there's, there's just so many things that we didn't know about it and uh, there was a certain amount of time before the, the minefields were fenced but we knew immediately that there were areas we simply couldn't go. The demining team suffered a major setback as two soldiers lost their limbs after stepping on a mine outside a presumably safe fence minefield. The end result meant that the British government had to stop active mine clearance and adopt a new tactic in demining. Residents in the Falklands seemingly had to accept that demining wouldn't go as planned. So our hearts sank. We thought, hey, we're going to be stuck with these mines forevermore. We were concerned for the safety of the British Royal Engineers who were clearing the mines, who said they could clear the mines. And we said, look, if their lives are in danger, um, or even if they lose a limb, we feel responsible. So maybe, maybe we'll just have to live with that forevermore. That was the reason why we were concerned. With the demining programme halted in 1983, leaving over 20,000 mines in the ground. The military changed tactic from a total eradication of the mines to educating the children and adults about the risks of minefields. And they would go through, uh, you know, their, their talks with us, um, showing us sometimes some fairly graphic images, so you think we were sort of 10 years old, but they really did have to instill this, this fear and respect of minefields. But, that it had to teach everybody that you know we had to change from being able to go anywhere and everywhere that we wanted at, at any time to suddenly uh, you know having to be very careful and having areas that were specifically off limits to us. Former Governor Howard Pearce once stated that only 95% of mines would be accounted for and would bring a sense of complacency to the community and increase rather than reduce the chance of injury. Just before pulling the plug on removing the mines, the Royal Engineers' hard work did allow some recreation for the residents. Surf Bay, a beach that wasn't very well used prior to 1982, was successfully cleared, allowing people to visit and for children to play on the white sandy beach. And what a relief that was, just to be able to go to Surf Bay and take your children down there so they could play on the sand and have picnics 
and build sand castles. You know, just the fact that we had one beach available to us was brilliant. And we were so grateful for, for the fact that the Royal Engineers cleared the approaches and made it safe for us. Next time, Lady Princess Diana inspires a worldwide campaign to ban landmines leading to the Ottawa Convention. But it took over a decade from signing the document to the first landmine being unearthed. Nevertheless, the clock begins to tick as the mindset shifts from impossible to maybe a glimmer of hope that one day millions of square metres could be reclaimed by the public. And then there was a, a, a real start at that point to uh, ban landmines and there were various different organisations all really clubbed together to push to, to produce what eventually became known as the uh, Ottawa Convention. I don't know that I've ever really spoken to anyone who believed that one day uh, all the mines would be gone. I'm not sure I've ever, ever heard anyone uh, confidently express that, you know, other than the experts who came to do it, who knew they could, bless them. <laughs>